Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Katherine Simmons. I'm a research librarian at the Mount Prospect Library. I want to welcome you to this program, Climate Change Adaptations and Solutions for the Chicagoland Area. I'm here today with my colleague, Angela Baker, and our presenter, Natalie Lynn Lichtenbert. Natalie Lynn has a degree in molecular um, pathology and has recently received her master's in conservation leadership and zoology. She is the chairman of the Hoffman Estates Sustainability Committee and membership officer for the Illinois Monarch Project Communication Engagement Committee. Uh, Natalie Lynn has led uh, international environmental expeditions in locations such as Baja, Mexico and Kenya, teaching about conservation and filming. So thank you so much, Natalie Lynn, for being here tonight. So hey there everyone, my name is Natalie and this picture on our screen right now is the first picture of the earth fully illuminated that any of us have ever seen. It was taken on the last Apollo mission and it changed the way that humanity thought about our common home. It reminds us that we are all connected and that our actions have an impact on our planet. So just to give you my own personal story, um, I became interested in nature and the environment. I am an only child, and I'm very fortunate to have two wonderful parents. They took me on road trips every summer, especially out west. We went to just about every national park. This picture represents a time when we were at a uh, road stop, and I went to pick one of these flowers, now my favorite flower, which is a black-eyed Susan. I went to go pick one of the flowers when my dad sharply yelled at me, don't touch the flowers, don't pick them. You know, he was teaching me to leave nature as is, to appreciate it, don't touch it, and protect it. So I was really, um, my dad hardly ever yells at me. So for him to yell at me like that, it really stuck with me. So um, as you heard, um, I'm also involved in a few sm other smaller groups, such as the um, Schomburg Monarch Initiative and stuff like that. So. I was just, and I'm also part of a, um, a group called Zero Waste Warriors that we focus on zero waste. And that's through the Climate Reality Project Chicago Metro chapter. So the question is, must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So first of all, must we change? The scientific community all around the world has been telling us for a long time that yes, we must change. And now Mother Nature is telling us. I think we can all see that even in the general media, uh, the idea of climate change is becoming more of a mainstream accepted idea, which thankfully uh, this is finally happening. And it's true that climate change has happened throughout the history of the planet from the ice age to completely heating up. I mean, this has happened for thousands and hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Uh, but what is so significant about this climate change event is that it's happening at a very rapid rate and it's very directly tied to human activity, you know, such that like if we were not doing all of this industrial type of urbanization that, um, you know, the planet's climate would have remained at a more stable level. So, which, you know, makes me feel very responsible. Um, the sky is not a vast and limitless expanse the way it appears to us as we stand on the ground and look up. In reality, it is just a thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planets. So we are putting 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every single day. That pollution, especially carbon dioxide, is building up, and because of this, it's trapping heats. So here's the basic science of global warming. This has been understood by scientists since the 1800s. Energy from the sun comes to the earth in the form of light. That energy is absorbed by the earth and warms it. Some of that energy is re-radiated from the earth in the form of heat. Some of that outgoing heat is trapped by the atmosphere, which is a good thing. It has kept our planet at a stable temperature. Now, however, we have been thickening the atmosphere by filling it with the heat trapping pollution. More heat energy is trapped and therefore it is warming our planet at unprecedented rates. There are many, there are many sources of human caused global warming pollution. 
such as agricultural practices, forest burning, transportation, and so many, many other factors. But the main source and cause of the rising global temperatures we are seeing today is the burning of fossil fuels. Just to give you guys an overview of this presentation, I'm going to go over some of the basic facts and what is going on. I'm going to make it then more localized to our area. And then I'm going to present you with some good news and some things that we can do. So we're going to get through these hard facts and then get to some more positive facets. So pollution is the burning fuel of fossil fuels. So CO2 is being released faster than at any time in 66 million years. Um, and that's since um, even before the asteroid hit the Yucatan and wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. So you can see that the air temperatures on Earth have been going up dramatically. 19 of the 20th hottest years were that have been measured with instruments have occurred since 2001. And this slide could obviously be updated with 2019 and 2020 and even 2021. So, I mean, look at the summer we had this year. <laughs> um, heat itself is a problem in many parts of the world and many parts of this country. Heat affects not only people, but animals, crops, and our weather. On a global basis, more than 90% of all extra heat energy trapped by our atmosphere is going into the oceans. This heat makes ocean-based storms like hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones stronger and more destructive. We can all attest to that. Half of the increase in global ocean heat content has occurred in the uh, just the past 20 years. So I'm sure for most of us watching, this is just even through our lifetime that we have visually been here. So uh, we can attest to this. All over the globe, um, all over the world, more than 200 cities have set their all-time heat records last year. We all know about the heat down in Australia, and then uh, since this time, we they have the forest fires. And look at what's going on uh, in the North Pole. When it gets so much hotter than normal, as it has been doing on a regular basis, the ice is starting to melt even in the winter. So, you know, polar bears, I hate to like have them as the role model here, but you know, they will be one of the, um, they will be majorly impacted. Then they are already finding new ways of eating and hunting um, in river streams rather than on the ice. So they're already trying to change their eating and living ha habits just so that they can survive. So um, this heat is just having such um, serious consequences, especially because the heat has been in the three uh, years in a row. And I would have to check to see what 2019 and 2020, but I'm pretty sure that the trend has continued. I mean, I know it has continued. I don't have to look it up. Uh, so this was this past June in Greenland. Instead of ice, the sled dogs were pulling the sled over slushy water. So, um, so this is, uh, as you know, they have the um, tidal floods in Miami and such that like this octopus was seen uh, in one of the major runways, you know, pathways. Uh, it's something that you don't see every day, but you're starting to see it more and more. They call this the sunny day flooding events. So Miami is one of the number one cities to be impacted by the rising sea temperatures due to the climate change. If you measure by the assets at risk, Miami is actually number one on the list. Yangzhou, China is number two. New York and Newark are number three. So now let's step back again and look at the earth as a whole. This time, let's focus on the ocean. This is the face of the Earth that is covered by the Pacific Ocean, and it illustrates the fact that when all of this heat is absorbed by the Earth's system, more than 90%, 90 percent, 
Actually, the scientists say 93% of this extra heat goes into the ocean and it's penetrating deeper and deeper. And with apologies to Las Vegas, what happens in the ocean doesn't stay in the ocean. This has consequences for all of us. You can look at these more precise measurements that the new instruments have made possible and tell the heat is now going 2,000 meters deep or more. And by the way, half of this increase has been in the last 20 years. This is really building up quite rapidly. Of course, the insurance and reinsurance companies are measuring this, and you can see that the damages have been increasing year by year. We get these tremendous downpours. We, we've all seen them now where we're getting no rain, there's a drought, and then within a short amount of time, we're getting these significant heavy rainfalls that are causing significant flooding and issues with our sewage systems. The scientists are calling them rain bombs now, and much more of the rainfall and snowfall in winter comes in these one-time storm events. And then we'll show you some more examples of that. But before we do, look at how they have measured the dramatic increase in these rain bombs. Uh, these are some of the record-breaking precipitation extremes. So these are just a few of the record-breaking floods that have occurred uh, recently from the heavy rainfall. This is from China, New Jersey. Uh, this is a picture of my parents. Uh, we had a huge snowfall in Chicago during the winter of 2013, 2014. Uh, some of you might remember it. I'll never forget the date because it was actually my mom's birthday. It still is her birthday on February 2nd. So, um, there is my lovely parents attempting to shovel their driveway. So speaking of long duration extreme events, the storms can stagnate over areas and stay there, literally dumping precipitation, be it rain or snow. So a question I get a lot um, all the time is, um, we get these polar vortexes that kind of hover in Chicago during the winter and people are like, well, you know, it's climate change, uh, the climate's supposed to be, you know, warmer and stuff like that. But uh, with climate change, what is actually happening is that jet stream is becoming more wavy. So you can see a jet stream is usually, you know, through the middle. So now the jet stream from climate change is starting to change the jet stream. So it's going up and down uh, more dramatically. And then at the same time, it's also going much more slowly. So, you know, it comes down into Chicago. And because it's going so slow, it seems like it's stagnated. And that's why we get those long expanded, really cold snaps. So it is, it is part of climate change, even though it's like, you know, it's not um, warm. So now to shift gears a bit, the same extra heat that disrupts the water cycle and increases the water vapor from the ocean also pulls some moisture out of the soil. It makes the droughts hit quicker and go deeper and last longer. Now, where you have drought, where you have high temperatures, vegetation dries out along the land, you have a lot more fires. You also have more lightning strikes in a warmer world. But these fires in the last several years have really raged out of control. And I don't really need to go, I mean, we all know about the fire season in the uh, US West is now 105 days longer. And it's, it's nothing that we're not aware of. Now the scientists are warning us that the world could see up to 1 billion climate migrants in this century. You know, as lands become in, uninhabitable, those people will look for other places to, to relocate so that they can survive. So here's an example. This is one of the thousands of farmers in Syria who lost their land. Uh, you know, what was once uh, farmland is now all become desert. So, I mean, these droughts are also affecting our croplands in the United States, uh, which ultimately will affect food, food pricing. So 
All of us have cause for deep concern about the impact of the climate crisis on the world's general food supply. I am not gonna go through all of these linkages, but the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just put out a masterful comprehensive report on this. All of the food crops we depend upon were selected by Stone Age women 10,000 years ago in conditions that were ideal for those plants and us. Those conditions are the ones that we are now changing. Just because the carbon dioxide levels are increasing, we are now seeing declines in the levels of vital nutrients in the plants that make up such a big part of the human diet. So aside from the droughts, you know, crops having difficulties, you know, growing due to water, there's also less nutrients in the crops due to the carbon dioxide. So how does that affect health? You know, we have allergens, diseases. We have all of these different things that are affecting our health right now. And you can see how diseases affect mental health and all of that, so. Worldwide air pollution kills 9 million people every year. Air pollution, um, so we will have to stop the global, um, so if we stop the global pollution from the fossil fuels, we can also at the same time clean up the air and save millions of lives. Deaths attributable to air pollution around the world are growing in number. There are so many millions of them now. You can see in some parts of Asia, like Thailand, had to close 400 schools. This is almost sounding like a pandemic. So my uh, laughter is always a nervous laugh, not a funny laugh. So um, by the way, in the United States and in most countries around the world, this is also a civil rights, human rights, environmental justice issue because the poor communities of color, disadvantaged groups, they have a legacy of being deprived of the same political and economic clout to defend themselves are the ones that are far more often living downwind from the smokestacks in near to the hazardous chemical dump sites, the coal ash sites, for example. So we need to understand that dimension of the issue. So with the passing of the recent climate bill, it's now a climate equity jobs act. Um, they do add a component to take into effect, yeah, take into consideration the uh, lower economic areas of the Illinois states, such that um, there will be more protections hopefully for them in the future. We're now seeing the spread of tropical diseases all around the world. Some of this is due to air travel for sure, but the way the climate crisis changes the conditions, that changes where these diseases take root and become endemic threats to the people who live there. And that's what's happening with climate and infectious diseases. So this also has an effect on waterborne diseases uh, such that are listed here, cholera, cryptosporidium, campy, and such. One of the most astonishing findings of the doctors is that more than two thirds of all the waterborne disease outbreaks in the US come in the intermediate aftermath of the rain bombs, these climate related extreme downpours. People are in the streets and it's just an excellent, um, it's just excellent conditions for waterborne disease transmissions. This also leads in the water to some bacteria that can cause illness in some, for example, shellfish. So there are other examples. So these waterborne diseases are also getting into our food supply. Flesh eating bacteria. This probably gets more attention in the news media than, uh, than the number of cases than there actually are. But every year there are these cases and they are growing in number. And it's a matter of great concern. So we're getting into my favorite part because I love animals and especially marine animals. 
so it's not my favorite part, but uh, close to my heart. The toxic red tide is now causing tremendous damage in coastal areas, particularly to the sea life, uh, especially off of Florida. We've heard about all these animals that are um, getting sick from the red tide um, because there's less oxygen in the water, especially so. Um, almost half of all the marine vertebrates have disappeared just in the last several decades. Our Great Lakes are being overtaken by invasive species. Climate change is just one more disturbance that helps invasive species to rise. They are the first to adapt to warmer climates, which uh, native species don't have the advantage of. So what I'm saying is that invasive species, they have a more um, dynamic range. They're better able to adapt to changes easier. They're more robust. So invasive species are uh, much more resilient than native species. So it's much more easier for them to take hold and then ousting out many of our native species. So it's really uh, disturbing uh, major ecosystems, even in our area. So we are now at risk of losing half of all land-based species in this century. Um, that again, just cannot be deemed acceptable. These consequences of the climate crisis are mounting up. So going on to coral bleaching, uh, you know of the coral bleaching events. While in a lot of cases, corals can recover, if nothing is done to curb climate change, the bleaching events will be worse and forever lasting. So, um, you know, certain areas of the Great Barrier Reef, they can go into a bleaching event and they can recover and regrow. Uh, but if they continue to have several bleaching events within a short amount of time, then they are no longer able to recover. So um, I was actually in the Coral uh, Great Barrier Reef in 2014. So um, I guess I was pretty lucky. So here's my same, <laughs> my same butterfly. And um, I'm a big protector of the monarch butterfly. This is one girl that I raised and released her two years ago. And I was just, yeah. So insects are declining at a very rapid rate. Um, for anyone that's older, you re might remember when you were younger, driving in your car, all the bugs that would come on your uh, you know, car windshield. And it's very noticeably decreased nowadays if you're going on a longer trip. They're at the bottom of the food chain though. So when they're not around, the animals higher up on the food web can't eat and it perpetuates in an upward fashion. So, you know, small mammals, birds, you name it. Um, you know, without a healthy insect uh, population, we're gonna see declines all the way up the food chain. Invasive plants can also be hardier and endure climate changes. So be sure to plant native species whenever you're planting your garden. Uh, now is the time of year where we're gonna start planting seeds for the next upcoming year. So I do highly suggest planting natives for our area. So be warned on this though, local nurseries are not thinking about this. They just wanna sell the plants and they don't care if they're uh, not native, uh, if they're tropical, whatever, as long as they look good, you know, they're gonna sell you anything. So you have to educate yourself on what is native for the area and uh, find sources for that. And I am always available to help you find sources for that. So especially for monarch butterflies, you would want to plant milkweed. So milkweed is the only plant that the monarch butterfly can lay its eggs on. And if that plant is not around, the butterfly cannot lay the eggs and that's, that's it. So you know, obviously we need flowers for our pollinators. So getting on to climate impacts in the Midwest and directly in Illinois, people want to know more about the local impact. So uh, many think that we're getting a pass since we're not on the coast, we're not getting all the wildfires, we're not getting the tropical storms, but we're not, we're not getting a pass. So projected impacts on the Midwest is extreme heat, rain, past droughts, loss of agricultural productivity, tree species lost, overwhelmed urban sewer systems. So, you know, going over this like tree species lost, 
you know, you see these invasive beetles coming in from other countries and they're hardy, they're robust, so they can infect our trees and then, you know, just take them down. So it's just, it's just not a good situation. So let's see. Um, heat is especially harmful in the growing season. So the Great Lakes are getting warmer which is encouraging algae blooms, invasive species, and a change in fish habitat. Lake Erie is plagued by algae blooms and one was, spot, um, and one was spotted. So late summer in Lake Superior, which empties into Lake Michigan. Okay, so the range of temperature increase since 1969 is between 2.7 to 5.2 degrees, uh, depending on the lake, but um, they're definitely rising for about an average of, I'm going to say, four degrees. So water level is extreme in past few years, up one foot from October 2018 to October 2019. So in decade, it went from a record low to a record high. So are you, as we've seen, our beaches are disappearing on the Chicago lakefront. I know I was just biking there a couple of years ago and the water was literally on the bike path. So it was like actually biking on the beach. So the bluffs in West Michigan are collapsing and um, Chicago really needs to work on its infrastructure along the lake because a lot of it is crumbling due to the rising lake levels. So this is the eroding block in Michigan. So, Erie and Ontario were hotter than this. Uh, then stormy weather caused upwelling of colder water to the surface. So you can see that uh, Lake Michigan average was 75.1, which is nearly 11 degrees above normal. So it's because of all the blistering heat that we're getting, especially uh, during the summer. Anyone who has lived here for long, we know uh, we're used to seeing much more ice on Lake Michigan in the winter. Um, you know, you could take your kids to the beach to see the ice formations. Now the lake is covered over for much shorter time and it's certainly not thick enough to walk on anymore. Uh, I know when I was younger, I used to be able to ice skate on many of my local ponds, but now I would not dare do that unless we were in one of those polar vortexes. But, you know, those are, um, not lasting through the whole winter. So I do want to mention the plastics problem that, um, does not just take place in the ocean. According to the Alliance for the Great Lakes, 22 million pounds of plastic are washed into the lakes every year. And such, and as they would break down into tiny pieces, they are ingested by fish and by us. So how is this related to climates? Well, making plastic, especially single use ones, takes much needed water and energy to produce, package, and ship. So not to mention that plastic is made from fossil fuels, from oil. So it's similar to our gasoline. And um, plastics by themselves are a very serious environmental problem and kill wildlife. So this is especially why I created a, a zero waste group to try to kind of decrease the amount of plastics in the Chicago land area. And um, we're focusing right now on restaurant sustainability. So our Great Lakes water is critical to our life and health. It provides 20% of the world's surface water and 84% 80 of North America's. So heat and rain are the top two problems. Temperatures are already up one degree Fahrenheit since the start of the Industrial Revolution and expected to rise another 2.5 degrees. Days over 95 degrees will be much greater um, downstate. I'm going to say it's been like that almost all summer here this year. So heat waves are likely in Chicago. Temperatures have already risen. 2.5 degrees since 1980. And then cities have an increased heat island effect based on how much water is paved over and how much is paved over and how much energy is used. So uh, the heat island effect is of course the asphalt um, parking lots that we have. Those are really absorbing the heat energy from the air 
and creating a, you know, an even hotter environment. So what are Illinois, Cook County and Chicago doing already to meet the challenge of climate change? So um, this bill, which is the Illinois Future Energy Jobs Act, was passed in 2017. It's now being implemented. RPS means Renewable Portfolio Standard and commits ComEd to purchasing 25% renewable energy by 2025. Solar energy will grow quickly under FIJA, providing many clean energy jobs. So as you might or might not know, this recently just expired. Um, I don't know if it was the beginning of this year or the end of last year, but just within a year's time or so, uh, the credits to be able to you know, put up solar panels, panels expired. So it basically was killing the industry. The community solar program will let, um, will let people whose homes are not amendable to solar to purchase panels in community solar arrays and parking lots on community buildings and in vacant lots. New provisions now will be included under the new uh, bill that was recently passed. So I live actually in the Hoffman Estates and we do have a community solar program uh, that I am a part of. So I know that some of my energy is coming from the renewable energy source even though I do not have solar panels. So I just added this slide. Um, it's official, Government, Governor J.B. Pritzker just signed the nation's most equitable climate legislation, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. So this was just last week. In doing so, he enacted nation-leading clean energy policy, putting our state on the road to 100% clean energy and making Illinois the first Midwest state to do so, all with a focus on the black, brown, and working class communities most impacted by the climate crisis. So this was a really, um, really big event and we're really excited. And I can give you, you know, some of the details, but it, I guess it is a thousand page bill. So I can't give you a whole lot of the details. I definitely have not read it. So just a big thank you to Governor Pritzker for his leadership in passing this urgent legislation and securing a clean energy future for all Illinoisans. And I will have to say that I know that Governor Pritzker really put his foot down in terms of what he was going to pass or not pass, like sign or not sign. Um, I mean, there obviously was a lot going back and forth between uh, environmentalists and then you know those lobbying, lobbying for the coal industry. So we do have the Prairie State Coal Plant down south, which is one of the largest coal plants in the United States. So obviously they had a lot of um, financial power to influence our policy. So like I said, we got it done though. Um, you know, some amends were made, but this puts Illinois on a path to clean energy, provides a just transition for communities historically dependent on the coal. It enacts some of the utility accountability measures in the nation, creates jobs and wealth in Illinois. So this is actually going to, um, you know, they are going to take those people who are in those fossil fuel industry jobs and they're actually looking to retrain them into renewable energy positions. So there is a fair way of transitioning and not killing anyone's livelihood with this change in our, you know, energy production. So Cook County has a sustainability website. Among accomplishments are reducing emissions in their buildings most efficient, mostly by efficiency. So yeah, this is what Cook County is doing. Um, They're adding electric vehicles, charging stations, reducing emissions and cutting landfill waste. Um, the PACE board um, with the PACE buses, they just recently in the past couple of weeks have made um, a commitment to purchasing more electric buses and obviously having then more electri uh, electric charging stations. So a big part of this was um, grassroots activism and really pushing the people in charge to, uh, you know, to try to convince them because they were looking to do the um, the combustion engine or whatever that's called. I forgot what it's called off the top of my head. Oh, compressed gas, 
um, in gin. So they were looking to purchase a lot more of those, but we were able to kind of influence them into purchasing more electric buses. So that is a big win for us and a big attestment to coming together as a community and really talking to our, um, you know, I talked to my um, Hoffman Estates um, mayor about that. So, and it made a difference. So uh, in Cook County, buildings include courthouses, county jails, administrative buildings, and health facilities. Uh, these are just some of the buildings that they're enacting some of their renewable energy techniques. So Cook County is now pledging 100% carbon neutral by 2050. And the board president asked last um, recently for a plan on how to get there to be created within the year. So likely steps for Cook County to meet its goals would be to put more solar panels on county buildings, purchase offsite renewables and participate in community solar. So Mayor Rahm Emanuel pledged in February 2020 that the city will reach 100% renewable energy for all buildings within the city, both public and private. Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the city council endorsed Emanuel's pledge. The city is now working on a climate plan. Buildings are the first target since they produce the most greenhouse gases. So uh, with the help from two nonprofits, the city's sustainability director has researched 12 North American cities for best practices and reached out to community groups, builders, unions, utilities, and other stakeholders to include them in the plans. So this is the timeline for the Chicago plan. They're gonna research best practices, engage stakeholders, develop policies, draft policies, and implementation. So some steps that Chicago has already taken, reducing emissions 11% since 2005, joined Global Covenant of Mayors, hosted North American Climate Summits, pledged city buildings 100% renewable by 2025, and one of 20 cities to win the Bloomberg's Challenge Grant. So museums like the Shedd Aquarium and Field Museum are helping Chicago reach its clean energy goals. Uh, this location that I'm showing you was also the same location where the uh, new Climate Equity Equitable Jobs Act was just signed. They actually signed it at the Shedd Aquarium. So LEAD means Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. The U.S. Green Building Council sets qualifications. Platinum is the highest level. Other libraries are aiming for LEED certification. Heating, cooling, use of the sun, permeable paving outdoors, green roofs, et cetera, are all a part of the changes that they wanna make. And I'm getting close to the good stuff that we can really do stuff about. Um, here is the Chicago sustainability programs under Emanuel, improving bike infrastructure, putting 270,000 LEDs in streetlights, holding green office challenges, benchmarking large buildings to you know, rate increase, to rate their energy use, and then retrofit Chicago. So there's also 248 more miles of bike lanes that, that I guess were implemented. So what can I do? What can we do as personal people? Uh, we can sign up for renewable energy. Um, I'm not sure if Mount Prospect has a community solar program. Eat a more plant-based diet, walk, bike, or use public transportation. That's one you hear all the time. Buy carbon offsets when you fly, plant trees and native plants, and then uh, avoid the single-use plastics. So let's see. Opt for renewable RECs, which is renewable energy credits, until you can obtain in-state renewables through community solar, rooftop solar, or local wind energy. Arcadia Power and Clearway are options for community solar. Renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuel. See the book Drawdown. I think I have a picture of that book at the end for 80 ready to scale solutions, some of which are attainable on an individual level. Um, also, with the new CJA bill that was just signed, there's going to be a lot more credits for solar as well. 
So the thing you can do leaving here today is to eat a plant-based diet. So um, just my personal story that I transitioned from, I was actually a bodybuilder. So I was eating a ton of clean protein, uh, chicken, beef, fish, and I gradually switched over to vegetarian. And now I have completely switched over to a plant-based diet. So my biggest, um, aside from all the climate benefits and then the, um, you know, not killing the animals, but also I've noticed a significant, significant improvement in uh, lessening joint pain. So raising livestock accounts for nearly 15% of global greenhouse gases. Some say up to 50%. And then overconsumption, eating too much animal protein has been shown to lead to certain cancers, stroke, and heart disease. Altering meat consumption patterns is critical to achieving various goals, including hunger around the world, healthier lives, water man management, terrestrial ecosystems, and of course, climate change. Eating a plant-based diet um, is just better for all of us. So recent research suggests that few climate solutions of this magnitude lie in the hands of individuals are, or are as close as the dinner plates. So uh, this is just a resource that, um, you know, just some resources on for vegan food. So I'm not trying to push it. I'm just like, just some resources, so. Um, there's a lot also going on with uh, negating climate change through the restoration of farmlands. Common agricultural practices are depleting fertility, eroding soil and causing compaction, etc. Farmlands are often abandoned and then left unused as farmers can no longer use them, so they're moving on to greener pastures. Repurposing these abandoned farmlands can be costly and labor intensive, but would help to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. Restoration by turning back into native habitats, which is my preferred idea, the establishment of tree farms or instituting regenerative farm methods. So regenerative, regenerative farming is a big thing that's coming up now. And we're, we ourselves are trying to do a lot of um, education on it because it really could improve the soil and decrease the carbon dioxide. So um, currently there are few financial incentives to move forward with any of these ideas though. So another big thing that we uh, like to talk about is food waste. The food we waste contributes to 8% at least of the carbon released into the atmosphere. In lower income uh, locations, refrigeration and storage are the biggest reasons for food waste. In high income areas, food waste occurs at the retail and consumer level. The best before dates are unregulated and they're very misleading. It's leading to a lot of waste. In higher income locations, food is selected for its appearance. So no one is selling ugly produce. That, so that is also being tossed out. Of course, we know about over-serving at restaurants, forgetting leftovers. Countries like Italy and France have instituted laws mandating that supermarkets donate unused food to charities, to composting, or to be used as animal feed. Composting is not focused on locally, but together we can create a movement. Contact, I don't know what Mount Prospect has. Somebody can tell me that after I'm done. But I know like in Hoffman Estates, we're trying, we're starting to get a lot of people asking for composting and I'm really pushing to get that implemented in Hoffman Estates. So the number one resource of all is human resiliency. So the one thing you can do every day is lead by example. If you're at the store, refrain from using a single use plastic bag and you know, insert your own you know message. You know, oh no, I'm I have my own bag. I'm always I'm just trying to skip single use plastics. So and then it didn't happen unless you post it. You know, on social media. I know it sounds silly. You might feel silly. Don't you know? People are watching you. I don't know why, but humans find it interesting to watch others. They want to be in the in crowd. Um, just from what I've heard from people, I post silly pictures of myself you know, doing things. And people say that it can be inspiring and it helps them to remember to do things. So um, don't feel silly, you know, leading by example. Yeah, make sure you look for progress. 
and then get yourself in a good place. Make sure you have good self-care and seek inspiration. Uh, you know, this is just in general for your good mental health and then to keep your spirits lifted because dealing with all these issues can be overwhelming. It can bring a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, obviously do what you need to do with the media, fill your newsfeed with good news or just avoid it altogether. Um, I don't think this is going to play. But um, yeah, Greta Thunberg is a good one to be inspired by. And this is just me doing some of my uh, talks and leading by example for Hoffman Estates. We have a recycle event that we do every August. And then here's the picture of the book that I was talking about called Drawdown. It's the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. So it is by Paul Hawken and it totally has a ton of things that you can do to you know, decrease your carbon footprints. So, and like you guys know, I'm from the Climate Reality Leadership Corps. So our next training is October 16th through the 24th. It is an education program that is free and this is going to be virtual, obviously. And they provide you with all the training, all the resources to educate yourself and then to learn to be, you know, to learn how to educate others. And then we also have the chapter um, chapters now for different individual cities where we can get more involved in lead through action. So, yeah, that was all I had. So I am ready to take questions. Thank you so much, Natalie Lynn, for that presentation. It was a lot of information for us all to digest. So yeah. as everyone is kind of digesting that, um, you can type your questions in the chat at any time. I do want to point you to the chat as I put a few links to the Mount Prospect Village website. They have information on their website on community solar, and also they have an organics and yard waste collection program. Um, all the information is in, in the links in the chat, um, so if you can look there for information on that. Um, let me just see, double check if there's any questions. Nothing coming through. Just give it another minute or so. See if we have any, any type, fast, type fast with your questions if you have them. I feel so overwhelmed giving this presentation. Mm -hmm. There is so much information and it can be so overwhelming and depressing. So I hope I provided enough like information on the good things going on, especially in our area and you know things that you can do personally. So I'm always available. Um, you can reach out to me on my social medias, which I think they're going to um, provide to you. And um, I can put my email in the, in the chat. And then, um, so yeah, I'm always available for any questions that you might have or things you wanna talk about, so. I can send out, I'm sending out an email later tonight with the uh, survey for this program. So I'll also include M uh, Natalie Lynn's contact information in that as well. But if um, anyone thinks of questions later on, you can always email me. My name's Katherine Simmons. Um, I sent out the Zoom link this morning, so you can always email me. But we do have um, some questions coming in. So the first one, are there plans for more charging stations in the Chicago suburbs? Uh, yes, uh, yes. They are in the works. So, um, you know, right now they're, and your budgets got messed up <laughs> with the, with last year, especially uh, budgets got messed up, but they are in the plans. They are being discussed. And, um, you know, I can only speak highly, not highly, I can only speak directly of Hoffman Estates because I'm on their sustainability commission. But I know that uh, many cities in the area are really moving forward with these electric vehicle charging. And um, and now Chicago is too, especially with the buses changing over. Um, the next question, how is or will climate change affect the local and national real estate market? Um, well, I think the real estate market is gonna be most uh, affected by our tax rates. Um, you know, to be honest, our area is one of the better areas to live in because we are not affected by wildfires. We are not affected by the tropical storms. And we do have access to ample fresh water. 
we're one of the few places that have that uh, that fresh water so um, available to us. But um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to live anywhere, basically. So um, I can't say that it's going to affect our our housing market specifically because housing markets all over will be all over the United States will be affected. So. Um, the next, um, it's kind of a, a question slash comment. Um, this patron uses their own cloth bags for groceries and someone asked them where these cloth bags are made and if it's possible that making those cloth bags could be against the environment, like if they're made in like big buildings that are emitting a lot of gas or, or fossil fuels. Do you have any comments on that? I mean, my only comment is that, you know, just, you know, don't have too many of them and with any kind of clothing or fabric industry, you want to choose organic, sustainable materials, um, bamboo, hemp, uh, organic cotton. Um, you know, I mean, I have a lot of those bags too, just from collecting them over the years or people give them to you. So I'm not going to throw them out, but I, yeah, I, you know, I wash them, I take care of them. Um, I think it's better than plastic. Um, next question, what kinds of volunteer help are needed or what kind of opportunities are there available? Yeah, there are so many volunteering uh, opportunities. So um, Margot, um, if you wanna send me an email to nat018 at hotmail.com, we can start talking. And then uh, next question is, this patron uses a Brita water filter and tank. Does using that help because they aren't using as many bottles or is it bad because they're still using a water source and there's a business for making those filters and that business is emitting gases? Well, um, I'm one of those people that don't think the tap water is that bad here. We probably have one of the better tap waters in the nation. Um, but if you do want more purified water, I do think the water filter is definitely better than um, bottled water. And then are there any little things that we all can do maybe in our homes um, that would be better for the environment? Um, sure. I mean, there's so many things like not using your air conditioning unless you absolutely need to and having your heat on very low and just using more blankets. Um, you know, buying less food, buying, buying only what you're going to eat. Um, I'm trying, personally, my personal goal is I'm trying not to do a load of laundry every week. I'm trying to do one every other week or uh, a small one, you know, in, you know, one big one one week and then a small one the next week. I'm trying to cut down on my laundry. So this means that I'm wearing my clothes more often, more frequently without, without washing them, which is they don't smell, they're fine. And um, you know, if they're only lightly soiled, I just wear them again. Um, you know, just really cutting back and really evaluating, you know, um, what you really need to do. Like toilet paper, you know, I know some people are using washcloths and then just putting those in the, um, putting those in the hamper. So obviously for one thing only, but um, you know, there's ways of cutting back. You just have to think. Um, yeah, did that help? <laughs> uh, I think so. <laughs> I don't see any more comments or questions in the chat. Let me just double check though. Um, yeah, so I, I think that was our last question. So thank you so much, Natalie Lynn, and thank you everyone for, for participating and for your questions. Um, and I hope everyone has a great evening. All right. Thank you so much. And yes, do feel free to reach out to me. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.